This video is brought to you by Nebula. In November, this odd-looking fella, Gert Wilders, won the Dutch election. Wilders' PVV party won nearly a quarter of the popular vote, coming out on top in the vast majority of municipalities. Despite this thumping victory, Wilders has been unable to form a governing coalition. And the big sticking points is apparently immigration. Specifically, a new so-called distribution law that essentially requires municipalities to house a certain number of asylum seekers so they're more evenly distributed throughout the Netherlands. Wilders, who's perhaps one of the most anti-immigration politicians in all of Europe, violently opposes the policy. But last week, one of his potential coalition partners, the centre-right VVD, decided to vote it into law. Wilders took to Twitter to express his upset, saying, we have a serious problem. Nonetheless, while this latest spat might have temporarily upended the negotiations, Wilders will still probably end up as Dutch Prime Minister. And whatever the precise contours of his coalition end up being, it'll almost definitely be the most immigration sceptic government in Dutch history. This is quite a remarkable ideological turnaround for a country that, and this might come as a bit of surprise to our younger viewers, was considered the standard bearer for multiculturalism back in the 80s. So in this video, we're going to look at how Dutch attitudes to immigration has changed over the years, how a rise in anti-immigrant sentiment fueled Wilders' rise, and what the next Dutch government might look like. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start by taking a look at how Dutch attitudes to immigration have changed over the years, because the swing has been pretty dramatic. Essentially, beginning in the 1960s, the Netherlands experienced a significant increase in permanent immigration. These migrants basically came from three places, former Dutch colonies including Indonesia, Suriname and the Dutch Antilles, southern European countries with lower levels of employment like Greece, Italy, Spain and Portugal, and countries on the European periphery like Turkey and Morocco, who were issued worker visas to fill job shortages. In response to this phenomenon, in the early 1980s, the Dutch government implemented a now controversial policy that we might describe as pillared multiculturalism. This essentially involved allowing migrant groups to retain their own culture if they felt like it, by allocating state funds for different migrant groups to set up ethnic infrastructures, like schools, hospitals and their own forms of media. Pillared multiculturalism stands in opposition to what we might otherwise describe as assimilated multiculturalism, which involves actively trying to integrate immigrants into a national society by doing stuff like offering language and vocational programs. The Netherlands' decision to pursue pillared multiculturalism was in part a reflection of the fact that, for most of its pre-war history, the Netherlands had a unique pillared political system, with Dutch society split into four pillars – namely Protestant, Catholic, Socialist and Liberal. Each of these political blocs was represented by different political parties, had its own education system, media and unions, and were treated as sort of separate entities by the Dutch state. It was also because the Dutch political class originally saw migrants as temporary stopgaps to fill labour shortages, and didn't expect them to stay in the Netherlands after they'd finished working, so didn't feel the need to integrate them into Dutch society. Anyway, originally this form of pillared multiculturalism was perceived as a great success, and the Netherlands developed a reputation as one of the most progressive countries in Europe when it came to immigration. At the same time as many other European countries were trying to reduce immigration, the Netherlands was actively giving out state funds to help immigrants set up their own religious and education institutions in the Netherlands, all facilitated by one of the most generous welfare states in Europe. However, by the 90s, the policy was coming under fire. More immigrants on worker visas opted to stay in the Netherlands than the government originally anticipated, and certain immigrant pillars were becoming increasingly cut off from the rest of Dutch society, while at the same time, the rest of Dutch society had started to depillarize in the late 60s. Ethnic minorities were often concentrated in certain areas, especially around Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague and Utrecht, which had higher levels of unemployment, undereducation, and criminality. 
In the early 2000s, the tide really began to turn against pillared multiculturalism, especially after Dutch sociologist Paul Schaeffer published his popular essay The Multicultural Tragedy in 2000. And popular migration sceptic politician Pim Fortem was assassinated during the 2002 Dutch national election campaign by a militant animal rights activist who accused Fortem of using Muslims as scapegoats. From here on, successive Dutch governments started reducing overall immigration and focusing on the assimilation of migrants into Dutch society. In 2007, the government passed a new integration law, requiring all migrants to pass an integration examination, testing their knowledge of the Dutch language and society. Gert Wilders was at the forefront of this migrant sceptic pivot. He started his political career as a parliamentary assistant to VVT party leader Fritz Bolkestein, specialising in foreign policy, before becoming a VVD MP in 1998. Wilders was expelled from the party for his outspoken criticism of Islam and Islamic extremism in 2004, but created his own party and was re-elected as an MP in 2006. Wilders is now the Netherlands' longest-serving MP, with an uninterrupted 25 years in Parliament. He's always been squarely focused on immigration and Islam, he was temporarily found guilty of inciting hatred in 2016 for calling for fewer Moroccan immigrants, and he's called for a total ban on the Quran, which he once compared to Mein Kampf. LSE research from 2017 suggests that Wilders' support correlates conspicuously well with net migration. In other words, Wilders' support goes up when there are more immigrants coming into the Netherlands. And, well, this sort of explains his success in last year's election. In 2022, the Netherlands received over 400,000 migrants, up 60% on 2021 and the highest number in Dutch history. While provisional data up to September suggests immigration fell by about 20% in 2023, that would still be higher than any year apart from 2022, so it shouldn't come as a complete surprise that Wilders performed well in last year's election. Nonetheless, despite winning a plurality of votes and seats, Wilders is yet to become Prime Minister, largely because he's been unable to settle his differences with the VVD, who have ruled out a formal coalition, but not a confidence and supply arrangement. Key sticking points include Wilders' support for Netherlands leaving the EU, or Nexit, and his controversial plans to ban mosques, Islamic schools and the Quran, which probably violate the Dutch constitution. Unsurprisingly, this only burnished Wilders' anti-establishment credentials, and he's become even more popular at the expense of the VVD. Polling by Ipsos from a month after the election found that the PVV would win another 10 seats if the election was rerun, while the VVD would lose 6, and only 53% of VVD voters still expressed support for VVD leader Dilan Yeshigos, who succeeded Mark Rutter in August. This falling polling will put real pressure on the VVD to lend their support to Wilders, directly or indirectly. If this happens, Wilders' government will almost definitely be the most migrant sceptic in Dutch history, concluding a remarkable 50-year U-turn in Dutch attitudes to immigration and integration. You've no doubt been following along with the news from Israel and Gaza, but if you want a better understanding, to dive deeper into the history of the region, then you should check out Real Life Law's hour-long documentary about the tensions and fighting between Israel and Gaza going back decades. That video, by the way, is part of Real Life Law's Modern Conflict series, where they regularly run through major ongoing conflicts from Lebanon's civil war to everything going on in Myanmar and the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. It's an incredible series, and it's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is the service we built with a bunch of our creator friends, and is the home to tons of smart educational content from all your favourite creators. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like Modern Conflicts, China Actually from Polymatter, or The Logistics of X from Wendover Productions, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because when you sign up, you contribute to the budgets of these big budget documentaries, and it helps us grow and expand our ambitions. So if you sign up using the link below, you can support us directly and get 40% off Nebula's annual plan. 
That's less than two pounds a month, which is an incredibly good price for an independent streaming service, which not only supports creators, but also provides you with tons of ad-free and exclusive content. Thank you for your support and for backing Nebula.